Okay, awesome. Well, welcome everyone to the next installment of our Appalachian Natural History Seminar Series. Um, perfect, thanks. Um, uh, today we are joined by Dr. Claudia Cotton, um, who is a soil scientist with the US, USDA Forest Service at the Daniel Boone National Forest. Um, I don't remember where I first met you. It was probably on some. It was with Chris. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, on a on a project. Some kind of yeah. yeah. So um, and you've been at the Forest Service for a while now. More than twelve years. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you and uh, I'll welcome you to tell us a little bit more at the beginning to talk about sure. kind of your academic journey. Absolutely. Um, because it, it wasn't That's linear. Right. Yes. Yeah, no, which it was is not. Great. I'm a non-traditional. Yes. It's so great. That's great. Um, and it's encouraging, I think, for students who are kind of like anxious about their careers, you know, Certainly. it's like Absolutely. you might not have a linear path and that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so uh, Claudia and I had the same major professor in grad school. Um, so that's kind of where we met and connected. And, uh, Claudia does awesome work in the Forest Service and at the Daniel B. National Forest, which is here in Kentucky. Um, lots of cool restoration work mm -hmm. um, and other kinds of projects on there. Um, so we're really excited to, for you to join us. Um, welcome and thank you so much. Um, and go ahead and take it away. And I'll just be here and if you have any technical difficulties, hopefully that. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Like Kenton said, I'm Claudia. And I'm the forest soil scientist for the entire Daniel Boone National Forest. Um, and so today I want to talk to you about how to love the forest without loving it to death. Um, so. So basically this presentation is gonna be a series of short stories um, to give you a, a, a big story. Um, and so the first is gonna be, you know, who am I and where, how did I get here? How did I get here today talking to you all about forest soils and restoration and all of that? And why do I care about it? Um, the second thing is I'm going to tell you the geologic story of the Daniel Boone National Forest, which is in uh, on the Cumberland Plateau and in the foothills of, of Appalachia. And then finally, I'm going to move into what are the effects when we have too much loving on the forest, um, when people get out there that, you know, rip and tear up, um, and what, do we, what have we done about it? How do we recognize that? And then how, what do we do to address those impacts? But then what can you all do to help us manage our forest? Because it's not just my forest, it's our forest. It's our national forest. Um, so, so without further ado, I'll move right on. So I promise you, this is not going to be a presentation about all these pictures about me. This is going to be it. <laughs> so, but I know the first couple are. Um, so my experience, like Kenton said, has been nonlinear. Um, Dan, I just want to show you a couple of photos of me being out in the woods. Um, this is when I was working on my master's and undergraduate in forestry down here. Uh, this was also my master's. And this was part of when I fell in love with the woods. Um, I've always loved the woods. But you'll see here shortly um, how that all came to fruition at a later point in my life than what I thought. And then this is some of the some of the some of these things that I do on the forest. Um, Look, I was digging a soil pit to install some soil water collector to see how acidic the rain was coming in and how acidic it was making our soils. Um, over here, I was looking at some campsites um, and looking at the soil to see. What kind of impacts that camping was having on those on those soils? And then this is just me having fun. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep on moving this mouse and it's gonna keep on doing that. So okay, so how did I end up in this outfit? Of course, I don't have my outfit on today, but um, so I am an eighth generation Kentuckian uh, from Caldwell County, Kentucky, and which is down around Lane Between the Lakes. And so I grew up down there. Um, I, I graduated high school in 1987. Then I went straight into uh, straight to Western Kentucky University. And so, you know, I was I was young. I was year old age, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me? You're asking me to decide what to do with the rest of my life right now uh, when I've hardly lived." Um, and so, I, you know, I look to my family. So I'm, I'm pretty close to my family, and so my dad was a banker. My mom was a secretary. And my dad was like, well, why don't you go into banking? You know, it's lucrative, uh, la, 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 la. So I did. Um, so I got a degree in finance and business in 91. Um, and shortly thereafter, I moved to Louisville 
And I started working for Fifth Third Bank as a mortgage loan officer. So suiting it, briefcasing it, <laughs> you know, the whole nine yards, wheeling and dealing. Um, I made great money. I made super money. But you all, it was killing me. It was not in my soul or my spirit to do that. I mean, I really liked helping folks get into new houses and get their first home spot. But I tell you, it it would just, I just felt like I was so disposable. And I'm like, I have made the wrong choice. So, um, so I ended up quitting the bank at 30. And I quit on a Friday the 13th. And the day after, I went to Arizona and I backpacked for three weeks. Because all the time when I was doing the banking career, um, I would come home and to give myself some peace, I'd put on my pack and go to the woods. Because I grew up, we've got family woods at home, and I've always just been able to go and relax there. So I finally took the step. And I, I really didn't even know then what I wanted to do when I quit the bank. I had a part-time greenhouse job lined up, you all, watering water and plants in rich people's houses. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is after making like lots of money. And I'm like, am I, is this Cinderella? What have I done to myself? Um, so I did not. Uh, when I was out in Arizona, I was really trying to think, what am I going to do? One morning I was hiking up out of a canyon and the sun was coming down the cliffs. You know, it was so beautiful. And I'm like, hello, this is what you're going to do. This is what I love. Um, and so I came back. Got, went to school for two years. I came and talked to Jim Lorenz in the Department of Forestry. I did, I was able to get a, an undergraduate in forestry in two years. Um, then I was able to get my master's with Chris Barton in two years. Um, then they shipped me off to Virginia Tech. I would have stayed here, um, but they were like, you don't need all degrees degree from one university, you know, from one place. So, and I still didn't know what I was gonna do. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting all this education and I'm still anxious because I'm like, what am I going to do with this grand education that I've got now? Um, by the grace of God or whoever, <laughs> by the grace of love, I was able to apply. The soil scientist that had been on the forest for 30 years had, was retiring. And Chris Barton called me and he said, this job's coming open. And two weeks after I got hooded at Virginia Tech, I was able to start as a forest soil scientist on the Daniel Boone. Um, and there I have been since. And so it's been a pleasure. Now, it's, it's not easy, you all. Um, it, I love my job, but it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that I love and I want to take. Um, so let me get on into it a little bit and we'll talk, talk about some of the challenges. Okay, so one more slide. Um, this is when I was in graduate school. Um, this is our undergraduate class right here. This is Jeff Stringer. He's now the chair of the, the, the Department of Forestry. This is my master's class. Uh, this is Chris Barton. He was my, our advisor. And then, so now this is Tara Littlefield. She's the state botanist for the state now. Uh, it's for the state. Um, <laughs> this is Alex Cherry. He is my coworker. He is the hydrologist now on the forest. So we work hand in hand with each other. Um, this guy right here, his name is Brandon Howard. He is now the state forester. He's the head of Kentucky Division of Forestry. So we all had some magic. You know what I'm saying? That I'm I'm glad that I feel I'm glad that we were able to partake. <laughs> so, okay. So when I look at the landscape, of course I've been trained to look at the soils, right, as my primary thing, and I know all kinds of things about soil. However, the five things that form soil: topography, biology, time, climate, and geology. They all also I have to know about those things as well because that's what causing the soil to have the characteristics that it has. And then finally, in order for me to do my job, I have to use these tools, GIS and remote sensing a lot uh, to give me, whenever we propose a project, I have to look across the, end. so we have about 710,000 acres. Um, and I have to look and see, are there issues with this area that I could, that could potentially make this project not go? Um, so with so I use GIS and remote sensing to get a first idea of that, and then I go to the field where those problem spots could be, and I try to check out, you know, to get some reality to the situation. But to bring it back, I've got to know something about all of this stuff in order to effectively do my job. And some days are better than others. <laughs> Let me tell you, because some days I've got to do some research, 
And other days I'm like, oh yeah, I know about that. So I hope to always be learning, I'll tell you that. All right, so the Dana Boone National Forest, um, it covers, like I said, 708,000 acres that we actively manage. How, or, uh, it's, it varies between 708 and 710. Um, so what you see here, and what you see most often on maps are, is this big polygon, and then this blob right here. So that is not all national forest managed land right there. Um, so the all of the forests in the east, they were created by the Organic Act, which was passed in 1911. And so what happened was that Congress would proclaim an area that our state could have a national forest, and they would put a proclamation boundary out. And that is the polygon that you see, of, of the white polygon. Um, that is the area within which we can purchase land to add to the national forest should it become available. Um, and so, but in the green is what we actually manage. So what, so all this white land in here, we call that in holdings. So that is, that is privately owned land that is all scattered among the national forest. And it's like Swiss cheese, uh, which it makes land management pretty interesting sometimes <laughs> because we've got to manage with our, you know, with an all lands approach with our folks because a creek doesn't care if it goes from private to federal lands back to private lands. It's all the same impact. So we have to, so we try and reach out um, and manage with the folks. Okay, so a little bit more about the Daniel Boone. Um, we have got four districts administratively. Um, the, the northernmost district up on top is the Cumberland Ranger District. That holds um, Cave Run, let me get my mouth working, Cave Run Lake and Red River Gorge. And probably a lot of you all know about Red River Gorge. Um, the London District's here in yellow, and it's kind of a long, skinny district. And it has um, Laurel River Lake down at the south end of it. Really pretty, actually. But it flows up clear to the Kentucky River. That's the boundary between the Cumberland and the, and the London District. Finally, down here, we have the Stearns Ranger, well, not finally, we have the Stearns Ranger District, and it encompasses a bit of Big South Fork National Recreation Area, which is what you see in green here. So, and then finally, we have, <clears throat> we have the Redbird Turkish Unit, and this was an area that was given, it was not given to us, it was, it was proclaimed in 1963, so it came on a little bit later. Than the, than the original forest did. So what I'm going to do now is just take you on a brief tour um, of some, what you know what some of the what some of the districts look like. So well, hang on one second before I do that. Let me slip back up here for a second. And it's important to note that the forest lies on the Cumberland Plateau, right? Uh, physiographic province, and I'll show that to you here shortly. That are basically eastern Kentucky. And, but where that plateau raises up is all along this western boundary of our forest. And what we call that is the Pottsville Escarpment. And so all of our weather comes in basically this way. And so it weathers this entire front of the plateau. And that has caused all these incisions and all this really cool geology to occur, um, which I'm gonna get into here, here shortly. So just keep that in mind because the red bird doesn't have that edge. Um, so we don't have the cliff line. We don't have quite the geology. You get more, this isn't mountainous. It's an eroded plateau, but you don't get as much cliff line over here and you need geologic formation as you do over here. So now I'm gonna start with the London district. And we have tons of waterfalls. We have tons of arches. Um, we have tons of spires, and I mean, it's a rock climbers heaven, to tell you the truth. But it's, if you love the woods, it's it's heaven. <laughs> so, so this is Bark Camp Creek Falls. It's down in Whitley County, Kentucky, and it's on our London district. And Dog Slaughter Falls is also a, a waterfall. Down, if you ever go down to um, Cumberland Falls State Park, there are all kinds of tributaries that run from the east. And they run westward into the Cumberland River. Um, and it's just above Cumberland Falls State Park. 
beautiful hiking down through there. That's where this is, these last few photos. That's one of the benefits of my job is I get to see some really pretty things. I now you'll see I get to see some really bad stuff too, <laughs> but but it's but it's balanced out. Uh, now Oakland Redbird, you know, with this being Appalachian Natural History, Redbird truly that's where the, the Appalachian culture is. Now you do find it in the other counties, no doubt. Um, but Redbird, it's really remote, and you get a lot of like. Uh, nooks and crannies and hills and hollers and a lot and family is really strong down there too uh, like you get family that you know you have a couple of generations living up in hollers um, and so so it's 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 a it's a pretty neat district down there what we don't have as much hiking down there but we do have a big ATV trail that um, the Redbird Crest trail that folks take advantage of and so this kind of illustrates the red bird to me. Um, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's just like a home place. So, but on the flip side, we've got resource extraction issues. We've got acid mine drainage. You know, I mean, there's with, with the pluses come the top, or with the negative, with the good things come the bad things. Okay, so then I'm going to move us over into um, our Stearns district down around down on the southern part, down around Whitley City and down in there, Stearns. This is natural arch, and it's just a beautiful sandstone arch that's that's down on our southern one of our southernmost district. And we've been recently doing uh, quite a bit of work down in the Delaco Mountains. These are our only mountains, legitimate geologically poor mountains um, that we have on the forest. And they're formed by the Pine Mountain Overthrust. And this is our botanist, David Taylor. So our botanist and our hydrologist and myself, the three of us, like I said, we are on all projects on the forest um, to make sure that those resources are protected because those are the building blocks. Those are the ingredients to an ecosystem. Um, you're not gonna have trees if you don't have good soil and water and you know and underlying vegetation. So as you can see, it's pretty woolly and pretty steep in there, but it's really pretty still. So now I want to bring your all's attention to our Cumberland Ranger District. And I'm going to focus in on the Red Wicked Gorge because that is probably where we have the most loving and <laughs> the most impacts from the loving uh, on our forest. And I just wanted to put this map up here to show you the complexity of the landscape as well as the, the large amount um, of foot trails, of overlooks, of climbing routes, of everything that this area has been. And it's been, it's been pretty popular since 1970. And if you haven't been out there, I highly suggest you all go out there. I mean, <laughs> but go out there responsibly, which, I, which will be part of the message, but absolutely get out there because it's so, so pretty. And it's about, it's about an hour and 45 minutes from here. It's not terribly far. Okay, so like I was saying a while ago, I think I've already made this point, but um, what you see here are the Cumberland, I wanted to point out the Cumberland Plateau and where the gorge is on the Cumberland Plateau. And then I already explained the pot full department right here. So the Red River Gorge, the story of the Red River Gorge, it's basically a story of four ecological processes. Um, the first of those is uplift. It's geologic uplift. And I'll explain all this as I go through um, here shortly. The second, I tell you, it's kind of hard giving a seminar if you have a mask on, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> I feel like I need a breather or something sometimes. Um, okay, pardon that moment. <laughs> so the second thing is just plain erosion um, because we've got some highly erodible landscapes. For, for different reasons. The third is down cutting, uh, fluvial down cutting, like by streams. And then finally, we've got differential weathering of different geologic strata. And I'll explain each one of these here as we go through the story. So if not for the Red River and water, it would there would be no river to gorge. Um, water is such a powerful thing. It is it's amazing. And it made every single nook and cranny that you see out in the gorge. Okay, so how, how did the gorge come to be? Well, the first part of even any inkling of the Red River Gorge was about 370 million years ago. And so this is the coolest website that I found you all. 
Um, so it's dinosaurvictors.org, and you can put in a Latin long, and it will show you where you were at this at different points in history and where the tectonic plates were. And yeah, so anyway, um, so we were at that time a very shallow tropical sea, right? So sandy bottom, crustaceans, think of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, not terribly turbulent, you know. So, <clears throat> but so, uh, so already the, I believe it's the tectonic Appalachians. The Appalachians rose in three mountain creating events. And I think the tectonic was first. Um, I'm not 100%, that's a, that's a prelim question, right? Um, but there were already Appalachian mountains that had risen to the east. And so those were eroding down into the seabed at that time. So then let's fast forward 70 million years. So, um, so 300 million years ago, we started getting like the Plotsko escarpment was right on the edge of the sea. So slowly things were kind of starting to come up a little bit. And if you look here, let me go back one second. If you look here, Florida's down here, all of this is Africa. That was like moving forward at that time. That tectonic plate was, was marching right towards North America, or they were marching towards each other. Each other. Oh. Okay, hang on, I think I went the wrong way. Yeah, obviously I did. Um, so then, 280 million years ago, the plates actually collided. And the Blue Ridge Mountains down in North Carolina, they're metamorphic and igneous because at that time, the, the rock folded and faulted and it was under pressure in that region. Now under us, we just got lifted up um, and nothing got folded, nothing got faulted. We are sedimentary. So we've just got layer cakes. We don't have any rocks as a form of pressure. We don't really have any rocks as a form of um, heat either. So, <clears throat> okay, so at this time we're lifted up and this is when the Red River started doing its action. So this is a, a profile of what, if you cut down a slice out of the Red River Gorge, this is what you would see as far as geology. Um, and so what happened is that we have this sandstone up on top called the Corbin sandstone, and it is resistant to weathering. I mean, it is, it's tightly packed and it does not, um, it does not give from erosive forces. However, underneath we have these shale formations and shale are ancient muds basically, and they erode just like that. I mean, they're a mess um, as far as stability and erosion. So, so as we eroded down into this, it would so it cut down like it's like a knife in a layer cake. But then, oh, did you go? There you are. Not only was it down cutting with the river, it was also creating differential weathering. Okay, so this is this is a this is a, a uh, an illustration of how arches are formed out in the gorge. So we've got this Corbin sandstone on top. As the sea receded, the ancient sea, it was working and it would erode out those shale layers that were underneath. And so it would erode, 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 erode. You would get a window from each side um, and then that window would open up into an arch. And that's, a, so what you see out there today is arches that used to be solid, but the material that's gone in the void, that was a less resistant bedrock. So we get tons. So you see how everything is just eroded. Um, it's so highly dissected. Um, and there's so many niches for plants and animals out there. And so here are some of, here's some examples mm -hmm. of the geology out in Red River Gorge. Because I had some of these listed earlier, but you may not know what I was talking about. So this is Copper Creek Falls, Wolf County. Um, just beautiful. It's about a two mile hike. Back into the back in the woods, and so when I say rock houses, this is what I'm talking about. It's an overhang um, where it's eroded out underneath it. We have tons. We have like hundreds of arches out in the Red River Gorge. These are two of them. Um, this is Gray's Arch, which is really popular. Double Arch is, is pretty popular too, um, and just with them beautiful like. Rhododendron, yellow poplar, nice music forest. 
out there. This gives you a nice view of the that it's a, an eroded plateau, that it's not necessarily mountains. You know what I'm saying? It's like you've got this tabletop, and then water has just worked down into it over time. And then you see that resistant, you see that cliff line up top that's real resistant. This isn't really geologic, but I thought it was a pretty photo, so I threw it in here. This is the, the suspension bridge that crosses. It's the shelter we traced. We've got a, that's our longest hiking trail that goes from Moorhead all the way down to the uh, Tennessee state line. And this is where it crosses the Red River. It was, yeah, we got it fixed. Yeah, we were inspecting it this day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is Tifoni. This is some of the geologic stuff that you're gonna find out there. You find like honeycomb rock is what some folks call it. Um, and it's just a climber's dream. Um, but you'll find entire walls um, all, all eroded out like this. So you will find, so this is, um, so out here, this is courthouse rock. This is a pinnacle um, or a dome rather. It's not a pinnacle, it's just a big eroded out solid rock formation. And then we've got tons and tons of miles of cliff line out there. Oh, I wonder where that went. Oh, there it is. All right. Um, so we also have, we have a lot of iron that naturally occurs in our geology. And as that got laid down in the ancient sea um, and it started eroding it to weather differentially. So it, you find these crazy patterns um, where it's weathered differently and, the, and these iron banding, uh, these iron bands come out, Lee's gang bands, Lee's, Lee's gang bands. And this is a sweet birch right here. You'll find these huge rocks in the gorge. Um, and sweet birch, they, they, they like them, or they, they compete well. I don't know how to say that because I'm trying to get away from saying they like. Um, but they they will grow naturally on these rocks because they like the rock. They, they like <laughs> nutrients. They go after nutrients on these rocks. <laughs> it's hard to not anthropomorphize the woods. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, and then finally, this is Raven's Rock. Um, it's a, so if you're crossing Iron Bridge going into the gorge, you look up in the sun and you see this in the morning, and this is the Red River going into the Okay, it's not the last. Um, this is, we have some really cool places out there too that are, they're like rock houses and arches. So what you don't see is there's an arch, like there's a hole in the roof of this rock house right here. And it's just it's surreal looking when you're up in there. You feel like you're in like Hobbit land or something when you're, when I'm out there. And then Natural Bridge is right across the street, Natural Bridge State Park. Um, and these arches span hundreds of feet. So they're, they're quite impressive. I've heard the gorge be called um, Arches National Park in a deciduous forest because we've got, now they're not probably not quite as grand as those in Arches Na National Park, but we certainly have the, we can, certainly can compete as far as the number. And then here's another Whittleton Falls and Arch. So here's the waterfall right here. And then we've got a window back here that makes it an arch as well. Okay, I do believe this is it. This is a pinnacle. Um, I wanted to put an example of this in here. This is um, chimney top, rock and pinnacle. And I tell you, if you will ever go out there, please stay within the fence. Um, we have had so many folks fall to their death out in this area for real. Um, they So this is the observation point and they'll come down here and they'll jump and then they can't get back up. And we've had so many people fall right down in here, um, like a lot. And it happens every year, so just be very careful if you, anyway, that'll be part of my, what I say later. <laughs> so, but it's gorgeous, so pretty. Okay, so, you know, I'm up here, I'm like, ah, oh, so what's the problem? You know, I'm, I'm, everything's beautiful, the grass is green, the trees are beautiful. Um, we've got a lot of problems, actually. So back in 2007, I believe, my coworker who's retired now, John Walker, he got a huge grant to take a look at resource damage, soil and water damage in the Red River Gorge. And so what he found was we had, 14, we, at that time, we had 1,400 illegal campsites, 
uh, or not undesignated campsites, I'll say, 281 vistas and 140, 194 miles of official trail. So that's, yeah, um, that's an issue when it comes to soil and water. <clears throat> Um, it's unofficial for real. Yeah, sorry, I may have said the wrong thing. Yeah. So we get at least a half a million. And I say at least because COVID has blown the lid off the pot, you all. Everybody's going to the woods now, which is great. You know, maybe they'll, I hope everybody gets the benefits that the woods can bring them. Um, so man, for a manager, it's been a, it's, it's been a, a, a full meal. So anyway, they've been going out since the 1970s. Um, our Forest Service appropriated funding, budgeted funding, and I'm going to get into all that, but it has reduced over years and years and years to where we hardly have anything uh, to deal with all these trails and all the, you know, the folks. Um, resource impacts are evident, and, you know, it's basically from folks not following rules. Um, from camping in rock shelters, which you're not supposed to do, from camping so close to cliff line, and let me tell you, I mean, I'll be the first to admit, when I was in my early 20s, I did the same thing. I didn't know. Um, I I went out there and I was, you know, but now I've changed my ways. <laughs> I've grown up a bit. Um, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it's easy to go out there when you're young and not um not and think it's not as dangerous or as special as it is. So camping, horseback riding, trash, OHD use, general mischief. Uh, these are the reasons for some of the impacts. So, you know, everybody wants to camp next to the creek, right? Because that's where your water is. That's where the beauty is. Um, but if if you if, if you camp in a place like this, if you look over here, you see how this is eroding into the, and this is East Fork Indian Creek right here. Um, and it really causes problems with the aquatics. Uh, sediment is our largest pollutant. Uh, are our most common pollutant in water. And it, it just wreaks havoc, havoc with habitat, with water quality. Uh, it can carry nutrients off site with it as the erosion is occurring. Um, so that's, this is one of the problems and we have a lot of these going on. Now we'll say, before I go into general mischief, um, <laughs> that we did just put out a project to do, to designate a lot more sites to put a tram in so that people can do loops more often, or they can, you know, that there's not as much part, there's not uh, the parking pressure isn't quite as bad. So we are taking steps right now to try and get a better grip on some of the management out here. So general mischief. Okay, so I don't know, you cannot, I, I'm gonna tell you right now that you can't burn green wood. Um, people chop, chop, chop all over our tree um, around campsites. And so, yeah, so anyway, yeah, so don't chop on the trees. <laughs> yeah. Bank erosion. So this is the result of long-term camping next to the creek without proper BMPs or best management practices. Um, it, the, the ground gets compacted, um, what, the water rises, and it just wreaks havoc on the site because these, these soils are very sandy because that Corbin sandstone member is just chock full of sand. And as that erodes, we get these sandy areas along the rivers. And then OHD use, um, that's, a, that's quite an issue as well. Um, and that we work with the counties and with county judges to provide opportunities for that recreation to take place because they belong, everybody belongs out there. The woods are for everyone, but there's a way to do things and a way not to do things. Um, and from a soil scientist perspective, oh, this, yeah, this makes my stomach hurt. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sorry, off road vehicle or off highway vehicle use. So, like rail cars, I'm not talking just like ATVs, I'm talking rock climbers and you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. And fine, I do think this is the final trash. You wouldn't believe how much trash we pick up every year, you all. Um, it's incredible. I mean, I'm like, whoa, what, what's going on? And we, we have so many volunteers and so many tires and, um, but yeah, trash is a, is a huge problem. So what do we do? What do we do to address some of this stuff? 
So this is that picture of Barton <laughs> I was telling you about. This is when he was a graduate student. So the soil and water program for the Daniel Boone goes back a long time. Um, and it goes back even further than 30 years, but we have some records um, going back to at least 30 years. Um, and so, you know, I told you we don't have any money. Um, our money has decreased over time. And so what we did, John Walker and I, we went out and we looked for funds to try and address some of these resource issues. And we found that the Kentucky Division of Water, they administrate um, EPA grants for non-point source pollution. So since, let's see, since 2006, we've been able to bring in a couple of million overall to help address some of these issues. Um, and the, the most important thing about these funds is that we can, we can spend these funds on private lands. It doesn't have to just go on forest service lands. So you know, I told you before that we need an all lands approach. This helps us do that. So this was this was our master's or this was yeah this is our master's professor this was Kenton's PhD professor <laughs> so anyhow this is when he was a grad student he was taking some um, acid mine drainage samples with the current soil scientist his name was George Chalfont um, so this is some of the work we've done so this is how we restore campsites we go in we rip them this the Red River is like right here but I just I don't have that in here. Um, so we rip them up, we disperse the camp ring or the campfire ring, we plant them, and we also dig out, we try to put um, icebergs. So we try to put rocks in there to discourage any where you can get a tent in there, essentially. And so this is before and this is after. So that is, so it's not that we're trying to run anybody's party. Um, we do, we're trying to protect resources and soil and water, and we think that we can. Well, we don't think we know. We know that we can do this concurrently, that folks can recreate and resources can be protected. Um, but it's a it's a balance. We have so with John Walker, um, he was able to so up to date, I believe. Hang on, did I have a number on that? Yeah, so we've been able to restore 504 campsites. We've been able to improve 204 miles of trail. So, you know, as trails go down into a creek, sometimes they just get washed out and it's a muddy gulch. This has allowed us to put steps in some of those places. Now, granted, we've got miles and miles and miles to go, all right? Um, there's, it's, a, it's constantly. It's like you do some work and then something else blows out. Um, but we do the best, you know, we're doing the best we can and getting and patching where we can. We picked up tons of trash um, along 70 miles. At the Red River, uh, these are we usually have big events. Yeah, we usually have big volunteer events out there, and um, we get in canoes and go out there and get tires and trash. Okay, so what can you all do? And this isn't rocket science. And I don't mean to preach, you know. Like I said, I have been in your all seats, um, and I love the woods too. I'm not going to be like well, this, don't do that, like a mama. Um, but go outside. <laughs> First off, find, and, find the beauty and, the, and appreciate, find what's out there. Because unless you care about something, you're not gonna care, you know? Until somebody knows that you care, they're not gonna care about what you think. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've gotta care about, about things before you can really do something about it. Stay on the trail. Um, if you see, get an official trail map. If you see, you know, I remember when I was going out to the gorge um, the first time, and I, I would just get off on these user developed trails, and I would be like, I have no idea where I am. Um, so if you can, stay on the trail, because that, that reduces erosion. Uh, it keeps vegetation on the ground, and that keeps the soil in place. Um, leave no trace. So, and I know this is sound so simple, but if, yeah, if you wouldn't do it, don't do it. <laughs> you know, don't leave your trash. Don't, don't do donuts in a sensitive area. Um, yeah, yeah. Keep it as light of an impact as possible. Like leave it, you know, when you leave, see if you can make it look like you weren't even there at all. And if you can, camp in designated spots and away from the creek, um, that will keep creek bank erosion from happening some. And then one more thing before I find, before I end, Always check the weather. This doesn't have anything to do with resource protection. This has to do with your all's protection. 
Um, always check the weather when you go out because we have had folks go out. I, I don't know if people don't really grasp the dangers that are out in an area like this. Um, and it's so pretty, you know, and you don't, you're like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. We had one guy a couple of years ago, um, it was January, and he went out by himself and climbed Indian Staircase, um, which is a real, it's a, it's a steep exposed rock. Got it to the top of it and an ice storm came in. And so here, here he starts trying to get off of it. There's no chains, there's nothing. He slid, fell, got a compound fracture, he was able to call out, which I don't even know how that happened. Um, and our search and rescue, it took them, it took them six hours to get back in there to him um, because the weather was so bad. And he was, you know, um, so the lesson, please check the weather before you go and know what you're getting into and, and be prepared for it. Like you can go out of that stuff, um, but just be prepared with the right clothes, with the right equipment. Um, so with that, Thank you all. It's been a pleasure being among you all today. So thanks for having me and I'll be glad to take any questions. I may be a bit early. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's a touch early. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. Um, so we look at we look at a number of things. We look at soil. Um, we look at where it can go as far as if there's stick line around there. Um, we typically try to locate trails away from the creek now because of the, you know, the inherent, um, not volatility, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, vulnerability. Yes, exactly. So we try, typically, we had, it was a couple of years ago, in Hayes Line, um, up around Hayes Line Lake. We had a big project to relocate a bunch of trails up there. And it, it's, it's quite hard, actually, because you've got to consider people's ability as well and what they can what they can do and what they can't do. Thank you. Yes. Are you looking like the trails that are up there? It's got like funny buildings to the forest. Is there any one that's more than anything that they would there? I hate to call anything out, to tell you the truth. Um, um, horses really do some damage. Anything can do some damage just if it's in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So if you've got wet soils, um, that's when things really can get torn up. And, and you know, be it by you can be it by horses or or you know off highway vehicles. Um, the bigger the the bigger the thing making the impact, the bigger the impact typically. Yeah, yeah. So, anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Did you use anything like, like, or did you ever think that you were going to end up like where you are now? Or like, no. Like, I do. As a matter of fact, I use a lot of it. Yeah, it's all, my life has been cumulative. Even the parts that have been a challenge, um, it's, um, so for example, with the bank, I learned that I could be successful. Um, and I was, I mean, it kind of gives me goosebumps now. I mean, but really, I'm like, well, dang, if I can be successful at something I hate, <laughs> imagine what I could do with something I love. Um, and that was really kind of the the thing that went off in my head. But but like so for example at the bank, I learned how to deal responsibly with people. I learned how to keep my word. Um, that's the biggest thing because I was like, okay, I will get this done for you, and I did. And that the that smallest thing led to a lot of success. Is keeping your keeping your word. Your word is the strongest thing that you've got. So, but yeah, I, but every single thing I've done, even that water and plants job, it, it showed me that I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. Um, so sometimes you've got to, you got to try on a couple of things that you don't really like. You got to accept a certain number of no's before you get that yes. Um, but just always get back up because always get back up. 
because you will, there will be another opportunity. Oh, y'all. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it's just so unfair for folks because you haven't lived enough to really know what you love. I mean, yeah, you got ideas, but yeah, yeah. Persevere, you all. It will, it will, it will line out. Just keep on, keep on hitting it. Yeah. Actually, the infrastructure bill that Biden passed is giving us a ton of money uh, to fix legacy trails and roads. Uh, we are getting a lot of stuff that's coming in uh, to be able to address a lot. Because it's not just the Daniel Boone. All the national forests have a backlog. Of, of maintenance on our recreation facilities. And this is gonna help us address, and the, the Get, Get Outdoors America Act, that was another one that passed that we're gonna be getting some funding uh, to address specifically some of the stuff that I've got listed out here. So it's pretty exciting. We might have money, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not gonna count on it until we have it in hand. So, but yeah. Um, it, that's the that's the biggest challenge because we've got a lot more problems. Well, we've got money to fix, and the people aren't stopping coming. You know, <laughs> and if anything, it's increasing. Thank you all for your time. Oh, there we go. Yes. 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 Yes.